Today we're going to talk about cervical spine surgery. Specifically, we're going to talk about cervical fusions and cervical disc replacements, referred to as cervical arthroplasties. We have other educational segments in which we talk about the actual problems related to cervical disc herniations and the anatomy related to that. In this segment, we're going to talk specifically about the surgery. So first of all, when do we operate on a cervical disc? We operate when there is a herniation of the cervical disc, which means that the disc is compressing the nerve or the spinal cord in the neck. And we have an image right here showing here a herniated disc. This is the spinal canal that the spinal cord and nerves run through. And here is a disc that is herniated and pushing into the canal. Here these discs are flat. They are not herniated. And this one you can see quite clearly is herniated. So there is a mechanical problem there. Discs do not slip back into place. They are, once they're out, they're out. And either they're going to shrink on their own, or they're going to have to be removed. When they're removed, one of the main ways in which we do that, especially if it's a large herniation, is to go through the front of the neck. The reason we go through the front of the neck is because the discs are in the front of the spine. This part of the spine is the back of the spine. These are the spinous processes that you can feel when you run your hand up and down your neck. In the front, we have the vertebral bodies, which are the building blocks of the spine. And in between, we have the discs. The discs are like a soft-boiled egg with a gelatinous center and a thick outer fibrous ring that holds it together. When a disc becomes damaged, it becomes more like a hard-boiled egg. The center becomes tougher, the outer part becomes weaker. When the disc herniates or pushes out of the disc space itself, it can compress the nerve where the nerve is coming out of the spine, or it can compress the spinal cord, which is sitting in the spinal canal between the lamina and the vertebral bodies and disc. So to get to that disc, we have to go through the front of the spine. And what that means is we make an incision along a skin crease in the front of the neck. Usually one side or the other. I tend to prefer to go from the left side. We then have to move the trachea and esophagus over to the side gently to get to the front of the spine. We also move the muscles and the carotid artery over the other, to the other side in order to have a portal, a small opening, that we can then visualize the disc. There are a variety of techniques for removing the disc, but the technique that I prefer is to cut into the surface of the disc, remove the portion on the surface with particular instruments that allow us to pick at that softer tissue, and then I use a high-speed drill to drill out the remainder of the disc, and I use a microscope to be able to see the back edge of the disc where the important structures are, the spinal cord and the nerves, because of course we want to make sure that we're not going to damage the nerve or the spinal cord. Once the disc is out, then we flatten out the edges of the, the end plates, which are the portions of the vertebral bodies against the disc themselves, so that we can perform either a fusion or an arthroplasty. So what does a fusion mean? It means that we put something in place of the disc that a person's bone can then grow through so that ultimately it's bone bridging to bone. And that means that there's no movement anymore at that disc level because it's all one solid structure from vertebrae to vertebrae. The advantage of that is that there is no further disc to herniate and a patient will not have any further nerve or spinal cord compression once that fusion has occurred. So once the disc is removed, what I like to put in place of it, if I'm going to do a fusion, is a cage such as this. These interbody devices are referred to as cages. The bone here is transparent so that we can see what we're doing to lock this into place. This particular cage 
is called an LDR, and it's sandwiched between two vertebrae. There's another vertebrae just like this sitting on top. Once we put that in, then it's locked into place by these little plates that slide into the cage and then into the bone and lock this in place so it cannot move and it maintains the alignment of the vertebrae. There is a big channel in the middle of this and we can put pieces of the patient's own bone that we can obtain when we're removing the disc into there and we can also put a paste made of what's called allograft or donor bone that has been specially prepared and is sterile. There's no concern for reaction or infection from that paste. And then that promotes or stimulates your own bone to grow through there and ultimately you've got a peg of bone going through here from one vertebrae to the other. So that's a fusion and that means your vertebrae do not move at that particular segment. The symptoms of the herniated disc are relieved. What I particularly like to do now in the appropriate patient is to put in an artificial disc or what we call an arthroplasty. When we've removed the disc, which is in the same manner as we do with a fusion, then rather than put a cage in that results in fusion, we put this device in, this artificial disc, and the advantage of it is that it does permit movement. Why is movement important? It's important primarily because it reduces the stress on the discs that are adjacent to the disc that has been damaged. And those discs now don't have to do all the work. The artificial disc can, can then still do some of the work and hopefully limit the likelihood of further damage to subsequent discs. It doesn't guarantee that there won't be other discs Damage. There are many factors that go into disc degenerating and herniating, but certainly if you can reduce the stresses on that disc, it does decrease the likelihood of further disc problems. The, um, the downside of an uh, artificial disc is that it may, in fact, fuse. And that's unusual, but it can happen. But if that happens, then you're really no worse off than if you had a fusion to begin with. These uh, artificial discs have been shown to hold up very well and in fact it is extremely rare that they would have to be removed and replaced or fused. The times that we cannot do surgery to place an artificial disc is when the joints of the spine are already damaged with arthritis and may have already fused themselves, in which case there isn't any movement there anyway, or there's so much arthritis that the movement is very limited to begin with, and then there's no point in putting in an artificial disc because you won't have sufficient movement to allow that artificial disc to be functional. Uh, the, the artificial disc recovery has been shown to be slightly quicker than when there's a fusion, uh, in either operation, I don't feel that a patient needs to wear a neck brace or a collar. Certainly with an artificial disc, patients can begin to move more normally a bit faster. Both result in relief of neck pain and relief of pain related to pressure on the nerves. So they're both very effective in relieving symptoms and they... Um, allow patients to get back to a normal routine of life. So the artificial disc does give us a bit more possibility that other discs will not be damaged in the future. It's still important to do appropriate neck exercises and work on maintaining proper alignment and posture of the spine to prevent problems down the line. That's the surgery that we do for disc removal, the two options, cervical fusion and cervical arthroplasty, or replacement of the disc with an artificial disc. Thanks for joining us for this educational video. I'm Dr. Ezreal Cornell. Hope to see you in another educational video.